Okay, Adam. Oh, he's not back. Oh, okay. 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 All right, folks. Well, I have to win. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. I can. I can. No, because that's that's fine. Uh, that'll work. That'll that'll be fine. Uh, we'll go to about eleven twenty out there. About thirty minutes or so. Because I'd probably y'all still probably wiping the the blood out of your ears in my lesson, right? No, I'm just kidding. But uh, okay, what I want to do today is just something, um, just kind of what we did about like the worldliness thing, but it's another reminder. I want us to bring up the idea. I did a class not too long ago at Rob, or Robinson Road, Hawn Freeway, um, where it came in our members now. Hawn Freeway. Uh, oh, by the way, in case y'all aren't doing anything this afternoon, I don't know if y'all have free time or what. They have an open forum over there. I know it's a kind of a drive. Uh, the Hawn Freeway Church of Christ, um, a CF Hawn Freeway in Elam Road. Uh, it's at two o'clock, but I know it's kind of, uh, it's kind of a, my opinion, not the best time. You know, two two a.m. on a Sunday afternoon. A lot of brethren are involved. You know, uh, did I say two a.m.? Two p.m. Sunday afternoon. <laughs> Excuse me, that would be really bad. Then two a.m. on Sunday afternoon, and it's like, whoa, things are really messed up. But. Uh, yeah, 2 p.m. this afternoon. I know it's kind of a bad time. I uh, I think I do think it might be better, perhaps you know, if we could put it like maybe on a Saturday. But uh, this is when they wanted to have it, so uh, here it is. But it's going to be an open forum on uh, innovations in worship, like women are leading uh, a Lord's table, hand clapping, things like that. And uh, I think it'd be pretty interesting. I have four guys coming out there, but uh, I'm I'm going to head over there after here, and. Um, See, we can learn. See, we can, you know, discuss. Anyways, but I, over there at Haunted Freeway, a few couple months ago, I'd say, we just ended a series on uh, Calvinism. I was teaching on Wednesday, or was it Wednesday evenings? Yeah, Wednesday nights. And I've gone through a pretty much uh, a whole uh, a series on that over the summer. Uh, it was a few months over the whole, the whole system of Calvinism. And I wanted to touch on that briefly because I think it's some, uh, I think that's something that's good to be reminded about because... That is such a foundation in a lot of the error that's taught today. A lot of the false teaching that goes around is a lot of it is based in Calvinism. A lot of people say Calvinism, yeah, I've heard of it before, I know. But you know what? That is the very foundation. That's a very, very fundamental, uh, 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 fundamental reason, if you would, why so many people today are misunderstood, even on something as simple as the sovereignty of God. When I say simple, I don't mean like simple to understand. I mean basic when I say simple. Basic and and it's foundational, it's fundamental, it's the sovereignty of God. And that's where I guess I'll start this morning. And if you have any questions, hey, get them hands up. You know, let's 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 interact, let's discuss. I think uh, like I always say that makes a class a class. Uh the time for me to talk to you and you to listen just happened. You know, now let's 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 you know do some back and forth if necessary, if you can. All right. When, when the Calvinists, went, well, I want to understand, first of all, one of the basic misunderstandings that Calvinism will have right off the top is their concept of God's sovereignty. Uh, the sovereignty of God in the Bible is very much taught, that God is, is almighty, that he is uh, you know, all-powerful, his omniscience, those things are throughout Scripture. It's, it's, it's just full of his sovereignty, but... We got to understand what is meant, though, with God's sovereignty. See, the Calvinist teaches, and uh, I had some quotes, which I don't have those papers with me now, from Calvinists, though, themselves. Basically, their concept of God's sovereignty is something along the lines of that God is in absolute control of everything, and that if God, if something happened um, outside of his authority, if something happened outside of his uh, divine uh, empowerment of that action, if you would, or uh, decree. That's a better word, to put, a better way to put it. If, it, if it's something happened outside of his decree, then that would remove God of his sovereignty. He's no longer sovereign. And he's like, oh, he's no longer in control. And because of that, that false concept, that has led them to think now that everything that happens, happens because God decreed it. And there you get their, that's what, that's what brings forth their idea of God's you know, predestination, that springs from that, because if you think about it, that's a logical consequence of this, this idea of God's sovereignty, that he has to have absolute control. 
A good illustration to show that that such is not the case, though, that, that being that if something happens outside of God's will, that, it's, that it means that he has no longer, no longer has sovereignty. A good illustration to show that that's not necessarily true is uh, just think about parents. Parents, I mean, you're at home with your children. Uh, I'm about to have my own child here in another uh, several weeks. Uh, Lord willing, everything will go well. Uh, I know that when that girl is born, I know that, you know, she's, under my, she's in my house. Uh, physically, I have the ability to just, to, to, you know, clobber her. And, you know, I'm not going to do that, of course. I'm just saying. But I'm saying from, a, from that perspective, I have, I have that kind of power over her, though. You know, I can dominate her, you know, to the fullest if I want, right? But what am I going to do, though? No, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to restrain myself, first of all. And second of all, I'm going to allow her freedom, right? Freedom to make certain choices. As the more, the more she grows up, I'm going to allow her, okay, honey, it's time to go to bed. She's going to have to choose, okay, I'm going to listen to daddy and go to bed. Now, here's the thing. If she's like, let's say, you know, a six-year-old. She's, she's six years old. I tell her, like I just said, it's time to go to bed now. Are you going to go to bed? And she decides not to. Well, is, does her deciding to not do what I want her to do, does that mean that I have no power now? I've lost my, my authority and my sovereignty over her as a parent. I, have, I've, I don't have control now. I'm out of, I've lost control of the situation. She's out of my hands. No, it doesn't mean that at all. And that shows, that's proven because I can now engage to discipline her and that shows that i still have power but what i'm doing now is i'm disciplining her um, she's being disciplined by my authority i'm disciplining her but what it is is she's allowed certain freedoms that way she can choose whether she wants to obey me and respect me and and show true love and commitment to me or not and see that's the whole idea that's that's messed up with the Calvinists, they think, well, since God has so, since he's in absolute control, man cannot do anything outside of his will. That's where they get the idea of predestination, that, that everything that happens is predestined. And that's where they also come up with the idea that man has no free will. Now, they'll get into uh, particular detailed de- definitions and say, well, yeah, actually we do believe in free will. And they define it. And well, that's, that's another issue. We'll get into that another time. But they basically take away from man's free will and say man really cannot choose to do what he wants to. He can only do what God has already pre-planned or foreordained him to do. So the, basically everything you do, every thought that comes in your mind, every action you, you, you perform, every word you say, is only because God has already planned it. In the, it's already in the programming, so to speak, the programming of time. Which brings a problem, though, because in which they will not admit this, because they realize the, the utter absurdity and how it's appalling, but this would ultimately repla- uh, place the problem of sin on God's shoulders. If people commit sins, if, if a man rapes a woman, it's not because the man chose to rape her. It's because, well, God, had already pla- God you already planned it to be like this. I'm only doing what, I can, what I'm able to do, and that's only what you, told, what you for- basically forced me to do through your foreordaining. But see... That is a gross uh, uh, understanding, and they, they acknowledge that. That doesn't make sense. So they'll back off and say that. But, that doesn't, but that's what follows, though, you see, with this idea that God being sovereign means he has to have absolute control. So, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if God's not willing that any should perish, if His will is always done, right? Then everybody's got to be saved, or else He's no longer in control. Right, and, and see, and that's that's a good point because these are the problems that they face, and these are the problems that we need to bring up to them and demand an answer. Say, hey, I want an answer for this. Uh, what's this passage mean then? If God is, is in total control and nothing happens outside of his control, then what does this mean? Because they'll want to throw that on you, and then if you don't have any questions, they're fine with that. I mean, hey, isn't that what most uh, preachers are like that today? Let them preach, don't ask them questions. They're like, oh, good. You know, that's good. You know, I preach, you listen, give me money. 
And that's, that's, the, that's the idea. But no, when you start asking questions, then it's like, uh, well, I, 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 you know, I, I, I don't like to debate. Uh, Christians aren't supposed to debate, you know, stuff like that. And they try to slap out certain things. But no, you ask them. You say, no, I'm just doing, like First Thessalonians 5.21 says, I'm testing all things, holding fast what is good. I'm just making sure this is good. So I'm going to test it. That's what I'm supposed to do. First John 4, 1 John 4.1, you'll test the spirits. But yeah, that's good. The idea here is that God's not willing that any should perish. But Jesus said in Matthew 7 that most will perish. So if God's will is that not a single one would perish, but Jesus said that majority will go through that, that the, the wide and broad gate, what do we have? A, there's something wrong here. Is there something wrong? Well, no, there's nothing wrong. There's not a conflict between Jesus here and God. What's going on? What's happening is there's this one thing that's standing in the way is human will, human choice. And that's the thing that Calvinists, that doesn't come across their mind because they think that's not a part of the picture. So they just, what they try to say is, by what you're passing, 2 Peter 3, 9, he'll say that, they'll say that the all there, the all should come to repentance, is talking about all the elect. But that's something that's not in the text. That's not from that passage. You don't read that in there. It doesn't say all the elect. You're going to get that from somewhere else. You know, and you ask, okay, well, where does the Bible, where else, where, uh, where else in Scripture does it teach <coughs> that we would draw from 2 Peter 3, 9, that is talking about all the elect. There's nowhere. And see, that's what they want, to, they want you to think. That's their, then that's their argument. That's what they have to say. Because if they say that's all men everywhere, that, have, that God wants to come to repentance, they do have a conflict there between that and what Jesus said about most of people perishing. So, I mean, that's a good point. And see, that's the problems you run into. But that's, that's what the Calvinists will teach. What I want us to do here is look at a few passages. And I want to throw these on you. And just see what you would say in response to the Calvinists, because these are some of the things they may bring up in an effort to try to thwart uh, uh, the teaching regarding some of their, the things they teach. You know, let's say, for example, let's start off with uh, people being born with a sinful nature, you know, total hereditary depravity. What does the Calvinist say? Let's look at a few texts that they bring up. And I'll, just, I'll give you all the, the floor just for a moment and see how you would respond to that. Because these things are going to be brought up. I mean, when I talk to people in the workplace or wherever, uh, they say these things. They bring up these verses. So I think it's good that we should be kind of, you know, warm at least on what to say in response. Look at Genesis 6. <clears throat> Look at Genesis 6. We'll start back in the beginning. Book of Beginnings. Genesis 6. And look at verse 5. Moses wrote, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. So the Calvinists will say, they'll read this verse, and they say, See, God looked at the wickedness of man, that, that men, that, you know, the, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And they'll say, and they'll get from this, see, men are just, are, they're, they're inherently depraved. See how they're just, every thought of their heart was only evil continually. These people were just, are just wicked people. They're, they're just, you know, born in sin. So what do you say to that? What do you say in response to that? Okay. That, the great, the, every intent of the thought of his heart, the man, wickedness of man. Okay. That's true. You had to say, well, how do we know this? Talking about, you know, adults and okay. Right. It does, doesn't it? Exactly. And I'm sorry. Were you finished? Oh, I thought you kept on. I'm, I'm sorry. I was looking at this screen here while you were talking. I thought you had more to say on that. No, that's right. How is it that uh, the children will be a blessing if they're uh, if they're born sinful? Because you know how they like to say, "Oh, look at the kids." And you know, I'm I'm glad this is something we can talk about too, right quick. When they say, oh, look at the kids, how they're crying and all that. And that, you know, doesn't that crying show you that, you know, they're just selfish? And that always give me, give me, give me. They take toys from each other. 
And it, I mean, it's 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 run out funny because it's 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 a it's a bad misrepresentation of little children. But they draw from that 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 means that children have a sinful nature because oh no, no one had to teach them how to steal. And it's like, well, the question: Are they really stealing? Is that is that really what the essence of their action is when they're taking a toy from another person uh, from another baby? Are they stealing a toy? No. And here's why I say that because you think about this. Okay, a child intellectually is not uh, like an adult. It's not mind is not developed. Maya and Seth, their minds aren't developed yet. They're in a stage process of, but they're not there yet. And um, because of that, the, the gospel is a means to address people who have an intellectual development to where they can reason. That's how God con- communicates with man. And from the Genesis to Revelation, it's always been through intellectual means. Man to read God's word or understand and to, to, to think about it and act on it now. And since children have no idea, they, they can't intellectually reason on this level yet like an adult. That's why they're not accountable. That it's impossible for them. Now people say, well, well, what about people in other nations that don't know about the Bible? Now, well, that's the difference there because they are a capable of understanding. They can observe uh, the world around them. They can draw the conclusion that there's a creator responsible for the material universe. They're not, they're not intellectually incapable. Children are. They cannot function on that level yet. They cannot even if they tried to. They can't. So for that reason, they're, they're not accountable. Now, basically, at that, what that means is their actions are, are, are they're not right. They're not wrong. They're, just, they're basically acting off uh, their own passions at the time when they're young. Um, now, I'm not comparing them to an animal, but like an animal basically operates off of instinct and just biological functions. A baby, a little baby is just doing what its body is telling them to do, or it's just its immediate passions is all it has to really go off of. It can't tell you I'm hungry, so it just it, do, it doesn't have that ability to communicate. So it just ah, it makes noise. It make it just does, right, and so they they interpret that as stealing. It's like there's a big difference in stealing versus somebody just acting off their own passion and because they don't have intellectual development yet or anything. That's not a, that's not even the same. That's an apples and oranges comparison there. So when they try to say, oh, look at the babies. They didn't have to be taught to steal. I'm like, well, they're not stealing. They're not stealing. Because if you're saying, you're implying they're sinning and doing that, if you're saying they're stealing, they're not stealing. They just know how to, you know, uh, self-preservation. That's all they really know how to operate off of. You have to teach them, though, as they grow up, how to control and harness those desires. That's when they become accountable. <clears throat> yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, probably uh, simplify that. They don't know the difference between right and wrong. Right, yeah. They don't know what right and wrong is. So it can't be considered as Right. Mm-hmm. They just know basically physical feelings. That's why we spank them because they respond to physical feeling. Ow! You can't reason with them yet, so you spank them. That that gets the message across. They respond to physical treatment. That, you know, and that's why physical things at that level is all they really know how to go by. All right. In Genesis six five, the wickedness of man. I want us to look down at verse twelve. Look at this though. Verse 12, Genesis 6 says, So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. And look at this. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. You see that? Notice that. That's, that's, it says all flesh had corrupted their way. So they weren't born corrupted. It says they corrupted their way. That's, that's a middle voice, meaning that's something they did up to themselves. Uh, they made themselves corrupt. They uh, made themselves wicked. They weren't born wicked. They made themselves wicked. Like uh, Psalm 58, 3, where it says they go astray as, the, as soon as they are born. It doesn't say they're born astray in Psalm 58, 3. It says they go astray as soon as they're born. How do you go astray unless you're not astray first? Then you go there to being astray. Yes. Yeah, they act up for attention. Mm-hmm. Right. They may, that may be because that's the only means they know how to get attention. Because if someone today needs attention, like, hey, I need some help over here, blah, blah, blah. The kids just, you know, they know, well, if I do this, this is what happens, you know, so I'm going to do this. And sure enough, those the parents, I guess, maybe I'll get a taste of that. I'll, I'll probably just fall right into that trap every time. When they say, do I say it? Yeah. <laughs> no, they, 
Every, all them buttons they said you learn how to push. I guess I'm about to find out what that's all about. So. Go back to the scripture you just read, where they're saying that every thought is corrupt, all flesh was. Then they have to go back though and explain verse nine. Mm-hmm. These are the records of the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. So evidently, it's a generalization in the scriptures that we've read that they're using to describe how man was. Not an exact of saying every, every, everything, but it's kind of like when you talk about uh, the way New Orleans used to be, it was known as Sin City. Huh. So there was, everybody there was sinful. So that's not necessarily true because there are churches there that right. are sinful. Mm-hmm. The same way here, Noah was blameless. So if he was blameless, then his thoughts and his intents were not all evil, and his flesh was not evil. Right, so. So it's a generalization. Right, so would we draw from that that Noah was not born wicked? Well, no. Not at all. We we don't say that uh, that he was. Uh, we don't, this doesn't say anything about how he was born. It just tells us, like you're saying right now, that Noah was a just man. This, he was just. He was perfect. And so I would say, like you're saying with verse five, that just tells us what man at this time was like. It didn't tell us anything about how he was born. It just says man was wicked. And but verse twelve shows how he got like that. He corrupted their own. They corrupted their way. They did it to themselves. So that's the answer there. I would, I would, I would push with Genesis six if that's brought up, is to show. Well, look, man corrupted their own way. Verse twelve. Go down to verse twelve. They go to verse five. Okay, let's look at verse twelve. They corrupted their way, and like you said, Noah was just. How did he get like that? Was he born like that? Like, well, no. Well, then how do you just how do you derive then that the people in verse five were born wicked then? Right. So there's either a discrepancy in the in, right. In it's not. Or they're using a generalization. Right. Yeah, you're right. It's, that's, and that's what's going on. It's a general statement. There are exceptions, like Noah, and that clear as he points that out. And uh, as from other texts as well that we learn from later on in other passages, we know that children are excluded from that too because of other passages. So good observation. That's right. Okay. Let's let's look back a little bit though. Let's look at another verse. Genesis five. Look at Genesis five. And this was pretty interesting. <clears throat> Genesis 5. And look at verse 3. Now remember Genesis 1, 26, 27. God created man in his own image, right? In the image of God, he created him, male and female. He created him. Adam and Eve were created in the image of God. For Genesis 5, 3. This is after the garden, after Adam and Eve had sinned. Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. And the argument goes, oh, see, after Adam sinned, now he tainted the human race. And see, now his children are born in his image and not no longer, no longer the image of God. And so that gets them around the idea of, well, God made Adam and Eve perfect, yes, and, but his children were not because it says they were born in his image and not in the image of God like we see Adam and Eve in Genesis 1 were created. So you see how they, try to, though they may try to slide that on you and say, well, see, since them, man is no longer in the image of God, we're in the image of them now. They're a tainted, sinful image. So that means we, inherit, or we, we inherited or we have derived from them a corrupt nature which angles us into sinful behavior just like that. So what would you say to that? Yes. Well, from a purely scientific standpoint, uh, if Adam, well, we, we, I, I think, you know, we know from, from Genesis that, that Adam was created in the image of God. Mm-hmm. Okay, I agree with that. I think that's. I think you know, there's some passages here I'm about to show that I think prove that beyond the shadow of a doubt. But uh, you're right, because if you trace that back, if you if that's a that's a well, I'll tell you what. Let me get to that in just a second. Let me get. Let me look at this passage. Yes. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, another fleshly body, right? Right. Because like you said earlier, Zechariah, uh, was it Zechariah 12, the, God forms the spirit of man with him. So the spirit comes from God, that's right. And the flesh comes from flesh. Like Jesus' body came from Mary, but his spirit, he came from, father, from the Father, he came from heaven. So, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead though, I'm I, Right. 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 They've learned. Yeah. Must. Must. That's great. Uh, that's a good way to put it. Because you're right. When people are born to the world, they're neutral, as far as right and wrong. And from that point on, from birth onward. From the influences they receive through teaching from parents, from observation from others, from that point on, that shapes and molds who they're going to be. Whether they're going to be right, whether they're going to be wrong. That's why you have to give them this information, you pull, put this into their heads so they'll know how they ought to behave. And they'll know the consequences of, of if they do this, this is what follows. But if you do this, this is what follows. And hopefully they'll reason correctly and say, well, I don't want this, so I'm not going to do that. And hopefully, and that's why you got to let them kind of go on their own a little there and say, okay, it's, I want you to make the choice, you know. You do this. That's how God is with all men. So, now. Oh, yeah. That's, that's yeah. Do as I, yeah. In other words, I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> that's what you're saying. I'm a hypocrite. Don't be a hypocrite like me. So, it's like, listen to me. I'm a hypocrite, but listen to what I'm saying. Uh, yeah. Yeah, of the world or not of the world, you're right. 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 And right, I've, I've heard some brethren before say that we're born, uh, uh, that we have a tendency, or I've heard some people say we're, in, we're inclined to sin. That we're not born sinful, but we have a tendency to, I'm like, I don't think that's true at all. I think that's false. I think it's totally false. I think you're, when you're born in this world, you start at, at, at zero. And you can go positive, you can go negative, but it all depends on, the things that you, the influences that you receive as you are, as you grow up. That's why the environment you put your children in, where they go, that's why that's so heavily important because they're only going to behave off of what the input they've received. That whatever they've received in, that's how, the, that's all they're going to have to work with and act on that. So if you put trash and give them all kinds of junk, well, the kids, if they're disobedient, disrespectful, well, <laughs> can you really blame them at first if that's all they have to work with? You know, but eventually they start knowing right from wrong. They know better than that. Then you can start, you know, being a little bit more firm with them about that stuff. Yes. Right. Right. It's all learned. Yep. Exactly. Exactly right. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, they say David was saying that in Psalm 51, 5, right? Oh, yes. Deuteronomy 6. All the time, yeah. Right. 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 Mm-hmm. If he's been doing this for 6,000 years, I mean, 
I think many times, including myself, you know, of course, I'm not excluding me. I think we underestimate the effort he puts forward. And it's like he works, he works hard time trying to get people to fall. And it's like, I know, I don't, I, I hope we don't get to the point where we're like, oh, I got Satan, I get him. It's like, whoa, you better say that. You better humble yourself a little there. Uh, you know, he's a lot more powerful than you. That's why you need this book. Because without this book, he's got you all messed up. You know, that's why God needed to give us his revelation so we would not get messed up. And uh, now, let me deal with this passage right quick. And I'm going to touch on one more thing we said here about uh, what you said with that Psalm 51. Genesis 5, 3, when it says he's born in Adam's, or when Adam had his uh, son, he was born in his own image. That doesn't mean that, the, that our children are no longer in the image of God. Look at Genesis 9, look at verse uh, 6. <clears throat> God here giving a universal principle regarding uh, the death penalty about how that's appropriate. That's appropriate for the, the taking of life, that to execute death on the, the, uh, the offender is an appropriate sentence. Genesis 9, 6, whoever sheds man's blood for, uh, I'm sorry, by man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. That's a universal principle that applies to all men everywhere. Uh, there's no specific here that's being mentioned when it said this is, this is being applied. Uh, uh, it's just being told to know about God, but this is a, a universal principle being, uh, being set in force here. Whoever sheds man's blood, by a man his blood shall be shed, for in the image of God he made man. That's the, that's the overall, that's the general rule. Man was made in God's image. Now, to go even further with that, you can mark this down. Look over in 1 Corinthians 11, all the way over into the New Testament here. 1 Corinthians 11, I think this also, this is way past Adam and Eve. This is way, way, way down the line after we've had thousands and millions and billions of people uh, have been, uh, you know, lived at this point. 1 Corinthians 11, in the context of the woman's head covering, look what uh, uh, verse 6 if a, uh, for if a woman is not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it is shameful for a woman to be shorn or saved, let her be covered. Look at verse 7. For a man, for a man, not, not a particular man, but just a, a man, indeed ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God. But woman is the glory of man. You see that? This is down here in the first century. And he said, man ought to not cover his head, for he is the image and glory of God. That, for, that, that removes the idea that uh, all people after Adam and Eve were born in the image of man and no longer in the image of God. You got it right here in the first century in Corinth. Men weren't to cover their head because they were in, they were in the image and glory of God. So that, that argument won't work at all. Now, what I wanted to point out, what you said a minute ago about Psalm 51, is when you point out and you chase this down, right quick, I'm going to wrap this up. It's actually 11, 22, 21. Let me make this quick. When you chase down, chase down the idea that where did the sinful nature come from? It didn't come from God. Hebrews 12, 9, um, Acts 17, 27, I think it is. I might be mistaken on that. And Zechariah 12, uh, 1. Show that the spirit comes from God. Our spirit comes from God. Uh, nothing impure proceeds from him. He's pure and holy. There's nothing uh, impure about him. So our soul has to inherently be right and pure. And without spot and blemish. Okay, so our sinful nature didn't come from God. It didn't come from our mothers because you have Jesus in Galatians 4 4 was born of a woman, born under the law. So if it came from mothers, then Jesus was born with it as well. Well, no, 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 they won't say that. They say, oh, well, it comes from the Father, which is, which is eliminated by Ezekiel 18, like you said a moment ago. The Father, the Son shall not bear the iniquity of the Father. But here's the point why I bring that up. If it's not from God, the mother, or the father, Psalm 51 5 won't work if they try to say that the nature comes from the father because it says, In sin, my mother conceived me. It's like, Well, no, you say it comes from the father. So Psalm, 55, Psalm 51 5 then can't be teaching any sort of inherent uh, sinful nature because that's talking about the mother. So just get rid of that. Because they'll say, Well, it comes from the father. Well, then there goes your Psalm, 55, Psalm 51 argument right there. They just, they just remove that off their list. So you take it to them anyway, they'll get, they, it trips them up. You just got to, you know, just, just stick with them. Because they'll have some little something to say. You know they will. They always do. But you can take it. I mean, no matter how, nit, how nitpicky they want to get with the argument, uh, the truth will always stand. That's just, that's the nature of truth. It won't fall. All right. Yes, sir.
Oh, yeah. That's... Oh yeah, and and that's one of the one of the great questions you can ask. Them. I hear, right? I ask I ask a lot of uh, preachers, or I hear a lot of preachers asking other like like Baptist preachers and those who teach such, uh, uh, the question of, well, why do you go out here and preach to people uh, if it's not de- if their salvation and being saved or lost does not depend on them uh, hearing the message and you know coming to a conclusion that they need to obey it and do it, then why waste your time? And the, the, the only argument I've really heard is, well, because it's a command. And it's like, well, so you're saying God issues pointless commands, purposeless commands that have no bearing whatsoever on eternity? I mean, that reflects on God's character. That makes it sound like he's a, a, a haphazard guy. He just kind of does stuff because he's bored or something. But God, everything, everything God does has a purpose to it. And he doesn't just do stuff because he, he wants to give you busy work. He doesn't work like that. He's trying to make our yoke easy our burden light he's not going to give us anything unnecessary to do yes yeah, so one more statement and we'll stop go ahead Uh, yeah, I mean, they'll say, of course, well, he, 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 there had to be an atonement uh, somewhere done for sin. My question is, then why did, why, did you have, why did God even ordain man to sin? You know, why not just have them all live perfectly if that's what he wants? But they'll say, oh, so he can show his justice and glory and all. I'm like, <laughs> it makes no sense at all. It, it, it's, it's really silly when you see uh, them trying to say God's trying to demonstrate and show his character by a mere puppet show. That doesn't show his character. Uh, it shows much more his character when man has the choice to say, you know what, through all the mess that, I, uh, you know, you know the, the, the things that go on, all the sinfulness and the persecutions I may face through righteousness, I'm still going to pursue God because, because his character, who he is, is what I want to be with. And that shows his real character. That shows, you know, like I heard one brother say, you know what what would make what would glorify you more as a parent 